Well, hey, micro friends, we're going to finish up um, our discussion of viruses and in general, and then we're going to get into some viral diseases and things uh, on Friday. But there's a couple of really cool things to think about with viruses in terms of some of the things they can do besides just causing viral infection. Uh, we finished up looking at some of the tissue damage and things that viruses can cause, and so yes, they actually can cause um, tissue and cell damage. But uh, another really important part of viral biology is their association um, with cancer. And now, certainly, just to be clear, most viruses don't have any kind of association with cancer, but some do. And typically what's happening is that um, there are viruses that can uh, either cause the cancer or they can set cells up so that they are more likely to generate a cancer. Part of this has to do with the fact that um, viruses, in order to get into the DNA, actually have to have a cell in the replication phase of the cell cycle, the DNA replication phase. And viruses can produce uh, proteins that will induce cell division. And inducing cell division is uh, not a good thing because, you know, our cell division needs to be very carefully controlled. Um, let's go to the board for a second and just do a little bit of discussion here. And because I think this is actually really cool biology, sort of uh, cancer biology. So in molecular genetics, we've been talking about the immune system. We'll be getting into the immune system when we're done, um, but uh, not today. So it turns out then that there are some viruses that are known as transforming viruses. That is, they can cause cancer. And a really cool story uh, that actually resulted in the Nobel Prize was the identification of sets of genes that are known as oncogenes. These are essentially cancer causing genes. And the story goes like this. Um, there are a variety of animals, uh, chickens, mice, I think chickens specifically as a model system, that there are viruses that can actually cause cancer. Uh, there are uh, viruses that chickens can catch and it'll actually cause them to have tumors. So uh, two guys, Bishop and Varmus, um, said about an experiment back um, in the late 70s, early 80s, in which they infected chicken cells with um, a virus that causes cancer. Looked for those cells and began dividing very rapidly as far as they were forming a tumor and began looking for the new piece of DNA. And they found out that the chicken virus was inserting um, a DNA sequence that they referred to as an oncogene. That is a gene that can cause cancer. When they began actually studying it very carefully, it turned out that that oncogene was a mutated form of a naturally occurring gene found in the animal. And the mechanism is like this. There are retroviruses. These are viruses uh, that, if you go back a few slides, that are RNA viruses, they get turned into DNA and they actually integrate into the host genome. Now, not all viruses integrate into the host genome, but some do. Um, now, I think actually herpes is one that is not directly integrating into the genome, it's actually being kind of carried along the side. Regardless, some viruses actually can integrate into the genome. And what happens over sort of viral evolutionary time is that there'll be um, a gene that is going to code for some kind of um, cell replication signal. 
and normally it's going to be under very strict control. The virus can actually insert itself in and when it comes back out, it is able to take, and kind of by accident, a chunk of the genome along with it. And you now have a piece of this uh, DNA replication cell cycle control gene that isn't intact, not complete. Um, and then maybe has some of the control <coughs> systems, things, parts of the protein that allowed to get shut off or um, be restricted. And so it's on all the time. And this now becomes what's known as a transforming virus. A virus that can cause cancer. Now, it turns out that in humans, um, we don't really have too many, if any, direct cancer-causing viruses. But in some animals, there are very definitely cancer-causing viruses. So let's just sort of reflect on this for a moment. If you've got a kitty cat, they have been vaccinated for feline leukemia. And that's because <coughs> feline leukemia is caused by a virus. And it's actually a reasonably infectious virus. Let's think about what this means. You have a cat that is not vaccinated. They come into contact with uh, this virus, like we might get the flu. And instead of getting the flu, they get leukemia. That is a pretty scary notion of a virally contracted cancer. So fortunately, in the human population, we don't have any really solid transforming viruses. The closest we can kind of come to is the human papillomavirus. The human papillomavirus, or HPV, uh, is not going to be a direct trigger for cancer, but it is very definitely pushing cells towards that direction. So it probably is a matter of time before a uh, transforming virus actually does appear in the population. Um, looking at how we're handling a uh, novel coronavirus, it's a little chilling to think about. But that's the idea then, is that we have oncogenes that are cancer causing. And it turns out then that you have to have an activated oncogene and then you also have to have mutations in a few other control systems. And that's really where we are now in the human uh, viral story, is that you have um, viruses that have bits of DNA that while not completely able to transform, they can begin to push things down the, down the path for a little bit. So um, let's just look at some examples of the human papillomavirus, shall we? Yes, let's do. Anyway, virology is a really fascinating subject, and the notion of transforming viruses uh, is a very cool story that we don't really have time to get into completely, but, you know, whatever. Um, hit me up if you're interested, and I can direct you to some more stuff. We can sort of have a good conversation about this. So HPV, um, it's a circular double-stranded DNA virus uh, protected by capsid proteins. And there are a lot of uh, HPV types. HPV 16 and 18 um, cause 70% of all uh, cervical cancers. And um, it gets into the cellular genome and it can then begin to trigger cancer. Now, um, I'm not sure if HPV has a direct oncogene in it, but what we know is that um, the epithelial lining of the cervix can be infected by HPV. And the HPV DNA integrates into the host's genome, and then it has the ability to start triggering rapid cell division, that is, the formation of a tumor. So um, most of the infections are going to be... Uh, you know, knocked back by the immune system, and you're going to have healing, but you do have HPV DNA being integrated into the tumor cell, and a very small number, but 
a number nonetheless, 0.8% will develop cancer. And it can be an invasive cancer in which the cells actually lift off the extracellular matrix, the basement membrane, and they can begin invading other tissues. And so this is what's known as metastatic um, cancer. And that's a very serious kind of cancer. It's no longer localized to one spot. The tumor has actually now begun to migrate. Uh, this guy, uh, Harold Zurhausen, found HPV DNA in patients that had um, cervical, cervical cancer. And so what they were using was a DNA label that they could hybridize or base pair with patient DNA. And so we see folks that are positive for cervical cancer are also showing the presence of the human papillomavirus. So what we have now is Gardasil, which is a uh, vaccine against the HPV, an HPV infection. And it's a uh, pretty effective vaccine. And so it's a thing that, you know, uh, both young men and young women um, probably should be getting um, the HPV uh, vaccine. You know, young women would get it because it would block the uh, virus from getting into their cells. Young men would get it because while they're not really at risk for uh, HPV-induced cancers particularly, they could spread it. And so it's an uh, interesting kind of um, vaccine story because unlike, say, for uh, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, where you're at risk of getting the measles because um, of, you know, just contagious disease, these are going to be sexually transmitted. And so you're having to acknowledge that young people might, God forbid, actually be having sex. So that's HPV. Uh, here's a little bit more of the retrovirus cancer mechanism. And this idea of what we call uh, the host-derived oncogenes. So when Bishop and Varmus were doing their experiment, they identified uh, this oncogene that they knew um, caused uh, this chicken cancers. And they knew the oncogene. When they began looking at the human or the, the genome of the chicken, they also found a corresponding, but not, um, it wasn't the exact thing, but the functional form of the gene in the genome. And so they developed this term that they called the C onc or the cellular oncogene and the V onc for the mutated viral oncogene. So that's the way oncogenes work is that we have them, but the viruses that are transforming viruses or viruses that can cause cancer, they've got a mutated form of it. So, um, the idea is that in the viral history at some point, the genome of the virus picked up a little piece of these different genes. And one of the things that's happened is that the identification of these genes and viruses has led to the identification of the genes in the genome. And we now understand a lot more about the control of cell division because that's what these genes are primarily doing. So we've got a list here of the different kinds of viruses, Rouse sarcoma, RSV, found in chickens, um, avian sarcoma, um, let's see, I'm trying to look at this, see, oh, yeah, avian myoblastosis is one of the first that um, they were discovering, and these cause a variety of different kinds of cancers, and we've got, well, like, um, let's see, in cats, and, you know, Different animals, mice have them. Uh, there's not, you know, uh, simian, monkeys have them. Uh, so there's lots of animals that do have uh, viruses that can cause cancer, and we just don't have one yet, fortunately. And what they have then done is um, allowed for the identification of a whole range of what we call oncogenes. So the virus has got the mutated form of it, but then it has been a indicator and a way of identifying in the genomes of the host uh, these actual really important genes. Now, in the host, the gene is under very tight regulation, or it doesn't have uh, specific mutations that make it so it's on all the time, different things. But it's a very cool story. Anyway, that's the story about oncogenes, and 
uh, retroviruses. And so um, that's all I have to say about that. Um, so in humans, um, we've got a uh, set of genes that can cause, or a set of uh, viruses that have been associated with it. They're not uh, 100%, but things like um, hepatitis B uh, has been associated with uh, specific um, liver cancers, um, HTLV, which is associated very low frequency, but with leukemias. Um, HPV, this is a pretty big one, um, and it's been associated with now like 5% of the different cancers. So it's not a guarantee, but it is something that's pushing it towards it. Um, Kaposi sarcoma is got a, uh, an associated herpes virus with it. Um, Epstein-Barr virus has been associated with some of these things. So uh, that's the good news is we don't have any direct associations, but there are some that are associated anyway. All right, um, let's turn our attention now to um, another disease-causing agent that was thought to be a virus, but it is not. And this is uh, the disease-causing agent known as a prion. And it is responsible for mad cow disease. Um, in humans, it's known as uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. It's known in general as spongiform encephalopathies. I like to think of it as sponge brain. So we've got mad cow disease in cows. We have a disease known as scrapie um, in goats or in sheep. And then uh, something that's interesting right now, uh, deer hunting season, there is something called chronic wasting disease, which is a prion-based disease found in deer. And what makes this an interesting thing is there is no nucleic acid associated with this. So it's not a bacterium. It's not even a virus. It is um, really doesn't fit in the standard kind of uh, models. It turns out that it's actually a malformed protein that is present in the brain. And it's present in the brain of pretty much all vertebrates. So the protein has its normal configuration, its normal three-dimensional structure, but it can fold into an abnormal structure. It actually folds into an abnormal structure and then it can begin to cause other proteins to misfold, other prion proteins to misfold, and it causes them to kind of fall out of solution and you end up with a, a very slow progression but a actual um, non-reversible lethal progression of this uh, neurodegenerative disease. Uh, in humans, the disease manifests itself um, as a neurodegenerative disease. It takes a long time, and you can see a uh, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob brain with a lot more space and holes in it versus a normal brain. Um, the prion protein is able to, if it's in the wrong shape, begin to trans, uh, transform, if it will, the shape of the other normal proteins. Uh, it is transmissible in that you can ingest uh, material, probably primarily brain, that has the misshapen protein in it. And one of the things, it's very heat stable, and so cooking it doesn't change it. And the mechanism isn't all that clear, but it may have to do with slight tears in the intestinal lining. Um, somehow, that misshapen protein is able to bump into the normal shaped proteins and cause them to change shape. So it is transmissible. Uh, it was first identified in uh, a cannibal tribe, or a, a tribe of uh, folks in Papua New Guinea who practiced ritual cannibalism. And, you know, I don't judge, whatever. But uh, it turns out that the men in the tribe would eat the heart and muscle of the dearly departed, whereas the women would be given the brain and spine. And uh, 
women and children typically begin to show this kind of disease. So, uh, smart cannibals don't eat brains, a public service announcement from the uh, Association for uh, Informed Anthropology and the Cannibal um, Anti-Defamation Society. I don't think it's real. All right. Um, additionally, then, <coughs> you can have spontaneous uh, shift in the protein, and you can have uh, spontaneous creutzfeldt jakob disease. There's also um, inherited familial uh, CJD, in which probably what's happening there is that there is a uh, an amino acid change in the prion protein that makes it so it's a little bit more likely to go into this unstable or disease-causing shape. So uh, the bottom line is, if you're going to eat people, um, don't eat their brains. And uh, when you're taking cows and feeding them, don't feed cows meat. Particularly, don't feed them uh, brain. So this is how the prion protein uh, is working. We've got the normal uh, structure, and it's got its normal shape, and then it's able to interact with the non-abnormal folded up shape over here. And um, when they go get into contact with each other, it shifts this one into the disease state. And uh, it's actually a interesting kind of biochemical uh, mechanism here of protein shape change resulting in disease. Turns out that it's not the only kind of disease that is caused by protein shape change that we're finding out information that Alzheimer's actually behaves this way. While Alzheimer's can't be uh, transmissible, there are proteins the, that are in the brain uh, the tau protein begins to change shape and slowly over time it begins to fall out of solution and form these amyloid plaques. Um, another disease that has been associated with protein misfolding is uh, Parkinson's disease. So um, Huntington's disease is also a misfolded protein type uh, disease. So it's not um, completely unique but the transmissibility is in fact the really odd part about prion diseases. All right, so that covers us with some very cool virology. We're going to pick up on Friday, uh, getting into some uh, viral transmitted respiratory diseases and then a few other viral diseases, and then finish up with the immune system and see where we go from there. So that's all I have to say. Uh, try not to eat anybody, but if you do, eat their uh, hearts and livers, don't eat their brain. I'm Dr. Lewski, and I'm out of here.